and then she yells out really loud, you know, says, it's on, you know, and so this guy just kicked the door in, and I come flying out, yeah. Playing his banjo in, in the village, you know, in, in New York, which is like a folk singing thing. Mike went all over Texas playing. Imagine rising to stardom as a child, only to face unimaginable tragedy. Today, we uncover the heart-wrenching stories of 25 musicians from the 1970s whose lives took a tragic turn. You won't believe what happened to these bright stars. 25. Christy McNichol. I mean, it's a nice feeling to have people always complimenting you. But sometimes it gets strange only because they treat you like you're not human. What led Christy McNichol from child star to a life out of the limelight? Uncover her journey through fame, personal struggles, and finding peace. Actor and singer Christy McNichol is best known for her role as Buddy in the Spelling Goldberg hit TV series Family, 1976, where she won two Emmy Awards and was nominated for a Golden Globe. In 1977, she appeared in the TV special The Carpenters at Christmas, performing several musical numbers with the duo. In 1978, Jimmy and she made their foray into music, recording the album Christy and Jimmy McNichol for RCA Records. Rumors began to circulate about a possible substance abuse problem. The studio released a statement about McNichol having a chemical imbalance which only fueled more speculation about her. In reality, she was experiencing some type of nervous breakdown. McNichol had been working steadily since she was a child, and all of the pressures and stress related to her career may have finally caught up with her. 24. Jimmy McNichol Beyond the spotlight, Jimmy McNichol's journey through fame and personal growth will surprise you. Discover the untold chapters of his life. Jimmy McNichol was a top TV and film star, a teenage heartthrob, and one of the most popular actors in the entertainment industry from the late 1970s through the early 90s. He continues to have an international fan base with many young people discovering his old work and becoming new fans. He performed in a band throughout the 1980s under the name Jimmy James, his last major acting role was as Jill Ireland's son Valentine McCallum in the 1991 television film Reason for Living. Afterward, McNichol stepped away from the music industry, later commenting, I know the outcome. It's a real big high one year, and the next year, nobody knows who you are. All that singing and touring and the guys behind you doing drugs. Eventually, it's going to get to you. 23. Mackenzie Phillips. How did Mackenzie Phillips navigate fame and personal demons? Explore her journey through life's challenges, addiction, and resilience. Mackenzie Phillips was a fresh-faced kid from a fairly famous family when she landed her role on the 70s sitcom One Day at a Time, a show based around a divorcee mother attempting to raise two children on her own. Phillips, daughter of the Mamas and the Papas lead singer John Phillips, saw her tenure on the show finish before the series due to substance abuse issues. Her Hollywood career never fully recovered, but she became a substance use disorder counselor in Pasadena. From the mid-1980s to the early 1990s, Phillips performed as a singer and toured with a reformed version of the Mamas and the Papas known as The New Mamas and the Papas. 22. Scott Bayo. It's daily, sometimes hourly. She's been calling me a rapist and a child molester for the past eight months. Among the heartthrobs of the 70s was Scott Bayo, who found his big break on the nostalgic sitcom Happy Days, starring fellow child star Ron Howard. Bayo's screen presence, handsome looks, and killer smile not only earned him the recurring role as Chachi on Happy Days, but his character's success as a love interest for the show's character Joni earned them a spin-off, Joni Loves Chachi, that aired for 17 episodes. Aside from acting, Bayo also ventured into the music industry, releasing several songs that captivated audiences during the 1980s. On January 29, 2018, 
Sexual misconduct allegations made by Nicole Eggert against Bayo surfaced. Several months later, Alexander Polinsky, another co-star on Charles in Charge, accused Bayo of verbally abusing and physically assaulting him while on set. 21. Maureen McCormick I don't know. We're real bad off. Three and get the new oh, toy. Maureen Denise McCormick, born August 5, 1956, is an American actress. She portrayed Marsha Brady on the ABC television sitcom The Brady Bunch, which ran from 1969 to 1974 and reprised the role in several of the numerous Brady Bunch spin-offs and films, including The Brady Kids, The Brady Bunch Hour, The Brady Brides, and A Very Brady Christmas, 1988. McCormick also had a brief career as a recording artist, releasing four studio albums with the Brady Bunch cast, as well as touring with them. Her only release as a solo artist to date is a country music album, When You Get a Little Lonely, 1995. Despite professional success on the Brady Bunch and its spin-offs, McCormick struggled in her personal life in the years following the original series' end. Addictions to cocaine and quaaludes, as well as bouts of depression and bulimia, all contributed to McCormick losing her reputation for reliability as an actress. 20. Frankie Lyman no, 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 That voice, those apple cheeks, arms wide, head back, he radiates joy even in antique black and white. That beautiful soprano flying high talent and presence and just enough ham to sell it all. And it was a great story too. Up from nothing, a shooting star. So when they found Frankie Lyman dead at the age of 25 one February morning in 1968, in the same apartment building where he'd grown up, it was the end of something and the beginning of something but no one was quite sure what. Frankie Lyman grew up too fast in every way imaginable. Frankie was a heroin addict at 15 years old. He tried to kick, tried again and again, and got straight for a while. Then his mother died, and he fell hard. 19. Marie Osmond Marie Osmond's career began at age three when she started performing alongside her older brothers and it seems like she hasn't stopped working since. She became a bona fide teen idol in the 70s when she starred in Donnie and Marie, an upbeat variety show that featured Marie and her brother. But Osmond's story is much darker than one might guess from her sunny persona and self-deprecating sense of humor. From surviving sexual abuse, to struggling with mental health issues, to losing several family members, including her 18-year-old son, Osmond had faced some unimaginable challenges. 18. Tanya Tucker In a hurricane, trying to find their way. In the 1970s, Tanya Tucker was a teen sensation famous for such hits as Delta Dawn. Tanya Tucker was just 13 years old when she recorded what would become her breakout hit. Recorded in 1972, just a few weeks after she signed her first recording contract, Delta Dawn wasn't written for Tucker and she wasn't even the first to sing it. By the time she was in her 20s, Tanya Tucker had turned into tabloid fodder and a bit of a cautionary tale for parents who were considering raising a child star. According to the Columbus Dispatch, her headlining brawls and rocky relationships have tarnished her legacy a bit. In the mid-80s, she was reborn as a country pop star. 17. Davy Jones Girl, look what you've done to me. Davy Jones left home to become a jockey. While he was an apprentice, he was encouraged to go into acting and got a role in a production of Peter Pan. From there, he played on Coronation Street, 1960, and the Pickwick Papers, 1952, before landing the role of the Artful Dodger in Oliver. 
In the mid-1970s, Davy rejoined fellow monkey Mickey Dolenz and songwriters Tommy Boyce and Bobby Hart to make an album and do some touring. On the morning of February 29, 2012, Jones went to tend his 14 horses at a farm in Indiana Town, Florida. After riding one of his favorite horses around the track, he complained of chest pains and difficulty breathing and was given antacid pills. He got in his car to go home. Just after 8 a.m., a ranch hand found him unconscious and an ambulance was called, but Jones could not be revived. He died of a heart attack resulting from anteriosclerosis. He was 66. 16. Marty Stewart. Baby, close that suitcase. Let's turn this thing up. When he was 13 years old, Marty Stewart ran away to join the circus. He was a child prodigy on both guitar and mandolin, and at 13 became their lead mandolin player. He never looked back. Marty Stewart's first two albums as a kid were won by Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs, and one by Johnny Cash, prophetic as it turned out, for his only two jobs before striking out on his own as a solo country singer were for those very artists. He doesn't try to hide their influence, even including Scruggs' grandson Chris as the newest member of his band. Life imitated art for Stewart in his colorful career, but the singer, like many peers, fought the law and the law won when busted for DUI in July 2004. Stewart was arrested July 23rd on the street in front of a McDonald's restaurant in the Nashville suburb of Hendersonville. Stewart spent two days in jail in Sumner County, Tennessee after pleading guilty to DUI. Stewart's sentence of 11 months and 29 days was suspended, except for the two days in jail. He was also fined $350. 15. Hank Williams Jr. Now these country music singers always been a real close-knit family. In 1975, Hank Williams Jr. found his voice, but almost lost his life. Until then, Williams had been unable to escape the shadow of his legendary father, who had transformed country music and died when his only son was three. The younger Williams began making music and touring when he was just a boy, finding fame by singing his father's songs in his father's style. But it wasn't enough. After a suicide attempt and a move from Nashville to Coleman, Alabama, Williams spent the first half of 1975 recording what would be his breakthrough album, Hank Williams Jr. and Friends, featuring two songs written by Toy Caldwell, a founding member of the Marshall Tucker Band. The album marked Williams' move from the traditional lonesome style made famous by his father to the rambunctious country rock sound he's since built a career on. But before Williams had a chance to promote the album, he went mountain climbing in Montana. Hank Williams Jr. nearly died after falling 500 feet off of a mountain and survived. Williams was tough, but so was his recovery, which took two years and multiple surgeries. Today, the man behind six platinum albums wears a beard and sunglasses to hide his scars. 14. Little Peggy March at 15, Peggy March became the youngest female artist to top the American music charts, a record that she still holds to this day with her recording of I Will Follow Him. The vocalist and songwriter was cheated out of many royalties, but recharged and found new fame as a leading Schlager singer in Germany and an in-demand recording artist in Japan, performing in the native tongue. She was taken advantage of financially by her manager. Her manager was appointed by the court to be her guardian, so he had legal access to everything. He signed her contracts. Even though she also signed them, her signature was not considered legitimate. 13. Stevie Wonder No summer's high No warm July Stevie Wonder began his career as a soul musician at Motown Records at the age of 11. As a child prodigy in the modern music industry and a child entertainer, 
Wonder's case shows how critical social factors are in the recognition and success of popular musical prodigies. Now that he's 72 years old and the prime of his youth is behind him, a lot has gone on in terms of Stevie's health as of the last few years. Rumors surfaced in 2019 that Stevie was suffering kidney failure and began dialysis. The Detroit Free Press spoke about the singer's issues in 2019 with musician Joan Belgrave, a friend of Stevie's for years. Joan said, He's got some health challenges, but he doesn't want a big PR thing out of this. He's in great spirits. You would never know anything is going on. That's how he wants it, and that's how he wants to keep it. 12. Donny Osmond At 14, Donny Osmond was a superstar. At 20, a has-been. At an early age, Donny had to face the realities that came with his reputation. Donny Osmond was a singer, actor, triple threat television series host with experiences across different talk shows, game shows, and variety shows. He made history by celebrating almost six decades in show business with the release of his 61st album, One Night Only a live album accompanied by a DVD of his sold-out UK tour in January 2017. Donny has earned 33 gold records, selling over 100 million albums and becoming a worldwide music legend. Back in 2001, Donny Osmond opened up to The Guardian about their upbringing, reporting that George had been a strict disciplinarian who assigned each child a number for family headcounts. They also noted he once beat Donnie for complaining. Aside from being scrutinized by his father, George Osmond, Donnie Osmond was not treated kindly by the press during his teen idol days. After making a name for himself singing alongside his brothers as the Osmonds, he got out of their shadow and became a solo sensation in the early 70s, with hits like 1971's Go Away Little Girl. Despite receiving adoration from teens everywhere, music critics weren't quite as kind. He reminisced about his meteoric rise to fame with The Mirror in 2016, sharing, I was 14 or 15 doing my gig and it's working. I'm one of the biggest teeny boppers in the world and Rolling Stone magazine comes out with an article which says, the worst day in rock and roll history was the day Donny Osmond was born. A teenager is just trying to figure out who he is, let alone having that. That's the ultimate bullying. It really hurt me. 11. Debbie Boone as, as far back as I can remember, we were singing as a family somewhere or another, but we really started when I was about 14 years old. Debbie Boone's 1977 chart-busting single, You Light Up My Life, sold 5 million copies, earned her instant star status and a Best New Artist Grammy, and is still considered among Billboard's Hot 100 songs of all time. Yet the singer, actor, and author says she was surprised by its success. Debbie feels that her career has been odd. It is far from a career textbook trajectory. Her career took off in a very unexpected way. She was happily traveling with her family in the Pat Boone Family Show. Suddenly, she had a career with no planning behind it. She didn't have an album ready. She ended up releasing an album which included a few songs she had sung with her sisters and a few new things. Suddenly, she was asked to go on the road and she had no idea what she was doing. She says that she wasn't ready. She was also confused for several years about what kind of music she wanted to be doing. She was letting everybody else tell her who she was and what was happening in Top 40 Radio. They would tell her to do this or that. She felt like a pinball. She would eventually go into musical theater and it was a time of great opportunities coming her way. She continued her career in theater. 10. Angela Bofill A lot of Cuban jam sessions. Uh, I just love music. And then I went Angela Tomasa Bofill was born on May 2, 1954 in Brooklyn to a Cuban father and Puerto Rican mother. As a teen, she sang in New York City's All City Chorus, which featured the best singers from all high schools in the five boroughs. In 1978, she was signed by GRP Records and released her first album, Angie, 
which was well received by critics and fans. It included one of her most iconic hits, This Time I'll Be Sweeter, and the jazz composition Under the Moon and Over the Sky. In 2006, she suffered a major stroke that paralyzed her left side and left her unable to speak. A year later, she had another stroke that left her without the one thing a singer needs. Angela Bofill passed away at the age of 70. 9. Janet Jackson Janet Jackson began as the youngest member of the Jackson family, and she began appearing on the variety show The Jacksons in 1976 at the age of 10. She also appeared in multiple 70s and 80s sitcoms including Good Times, A New Kind of Family, Different Strokes, and Fame. Janet Jackson discussed her childhood, a period fraught with abuse and fear. Jackson, the second youngest of nine siblings, said that her other brothers and sisters thought their father, Joe Jackson, was relatively easy on her, but she still found him to be very strict and tough, rarely told her that he loved her, didn't like it when she cried, and insisted that she call him Joseph instead of Dad. For a roughly two-year period from 1995 to 1997, Janet Jackson dealt with a long-lasting depressive episode. It coincided with a period in which she didn't speak with her sister Latoya Jackson and was so distant from her brother Michael Jackson that she had not yet met his baby son. I didn't know what it was and it would come like here and there. I thought I was just having a funky day and it just got progressively worse until it was every day. Jackson recalled that while recording The Velvet Rope, she would cry so hard she would be unable to sing delaying the production of the album because it was too overwhelming at times. 8. Tony DeFranco And then she yells out really loud, you know, says, It's on, you know, and so these guys just kick the door in and I come playing out. Yeah. 70s teen idol who is the lead singer of the DeFranco family featuring Tony DeFranco. Tony DeFranco's family band that took the pop scene by storm as they were unexpectedly discovered and rapidly topped world charts. However, they vanished in the same way. Tony was 13 when the family hit it big. After a while, they moved base from Welland to California as things were going great. But three years down the line, the family lost virtually everything as disco took over. They had signed a terrible contract, which allowed Lawford to take advantage of them. The teen idol had a couple of bad phases as he had encounters with hard drugs while trying to reinvent himself. 7. Andy Gibb Open up the heaven in your heart and let me be the things you are to me. What led to the downfall of this 70s heartthrob? Stay tuned as we uncover Andy Gibb's tragic tale of fame, addiction, and lost dreams. Andy Gibb, the pop singer who skyrocketed to fame as a teen idol, was hopeful to make a comeback before his life came to a sudden end at age 30. Andy struggled with his insecurities as he attempted to cope with fame. Andy Gibb's struggles led to addiction. His hit songs include I Just Wanna Be Your Everything in 1977, Shadow Dancing and An Everlasting Love in 1978, and Our Love Don't Throw It All Away in 1979. 6. Tony Danza Of course I ended up tap dancing, okay? Well this time I said, no way, that's not gonna happen. I grabbed the writers, I worked with them all week, huh? I worked with- From taxi fame to personal struggles, Tony Danza's story will leave you on the edge of your seat. Uncover the highs and lows of his journey in the spotlight. Long before Tony Danza took the stage to perform in a Broadway musical, he showed off his previously little-known ability and enjoyment of singing. In 2002, Danza recorded what is to date his only album, a piece for Syndrome Records called The House I Live In. Evoking mid-20th century crooners like Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Perry Como, the album consists entirely of covers of swing and big band standards. Danza boisterously belted his way through familiar tunes like That's All, Pennies from Heaven, I'll Be Seeing You, 
and God bless America. It might be said Tony Danza has led a charmed life with a career spanning more than four decades, but fans may have forgotten he nearly lost his life in a horrific skiing accident 29 years ago. About six months before the skiing mishap, Danza's mother had died, and he was still experiencing tremendous grief because of the Christmas season, thinking about her while he skied to the point of distraction. 5. Rick Springfield She's loving him with that body, I just know it. And he's holding her in his arms late, late at night. How did the Jesse's girl heartthrob face his own personal battles? Find out as we reveal Rick Springfield's journey through fame, addiction, and redemption. A member of the pop rock group Zoot from 1969 to 1971, he had an initial career as a charismatic teen idol. He started his string of solo works with a debut single called Speak to the Sky that reached the top 10 in Australia. He had a number one hit with Jesse's Girl in 1981 in both Australia and the US. Rick Springfield contemplated suicide multiple times throughout his long battle with depression. The Jesse's Girl singer told ABC News that suicidal thoughts are part of his makeup and he contemplated taking his own life. Springfield, 68, first revealed that he had a failed suicide attempt when he was 17 years old in his autobiography, Late Late at Night. He is now discussing his battle so that others can have hope and know that the moment will pass. 4. Sean Cassidy Behind the charming smile lies a tale of triumph and tragedy. Explore Sean Cassidy's journey through fame, loss, and the pursuit of happiness. While still in high school, Cassidy signed a contract with Warner Brothers Records. This led to three multi-platinum albums, numerous top 10 hits, and sold out concerts at every major arena in the country, including Houston's Astrodome and New York's Madison Square Garden. Almost concurrently, Cassidy starred in the ABC television series, The Hardy Boys Mysteries. His song, Da Du Ron Ron, reached number 17 on the German charts in April of 1977. This was the same year David Cassidy's song, Getting It On The Street, reached number 12 on the same exact chart. Da Du Ron Ron reached number one on the US Billboard Hot 100, number one on the Cashbox Top 100, and number one on RPM Magazine's Canada Top Singles. In 1980, Sean Cassidy was at an age when most people are still trying to decide how to get started in their careers, and Cassidy had already hit the very top of his. He talked about how he saw that year, when he was just 21 years old, as a transitional year for me in so many ways. Tastes in and sounds of music were changing, and most importantly, the AM radio he had relied on to play his records was becoming less popular in favor of FM. Disco was coming onto the scene. It was so big, in fact, that he was being pressured to jump on into this new genre, and since he didn't want to hop on the bandwagon, he refused and took his talents elsewhere. 3. Leaf Garrett From teen idol to a life filled with turmoil, Leif Garrett's story is more than meets the eye. Discover the shocking twists that forever changed his path. Along with the likes of Sean and David Cassidy and the Bay City Rollers, Leif Garrett is one of those names people automatically think of when it comes to 1970s teen idols. Compared to the most sexually charged disco acts and alcohol-fueled rock bands of the era, Garrett was ostensibly the wholesome, inoffensive alternative, not only for his fan base, largely made up of pre-teen and teenage girls, but also for their parents. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before Garrett was seemingly all washed up, having fallen victim to the pitfalls that doom the adult careers of many a former child actor or teen pop heartthrob, of which he was both. By the mid-80s, Garrett's music career was essentially over, and while he did return to acting, it was mostly in forgettable B-movies. Worse, 
He was also in the throes of a serious drug addiction and was dealing with guilt over his involvement in a vehicular accident that paralyzed one of his good friends. 2. David Cassidy What dark shadows haunted the life of this 70s heartthrob? Let's delve into David Cassidy's journey filled with fame, fortune, and unexpected sorrow. Born in New York City in 1950, David Cassidy rose to fame as the heartthrob of the 1970s musical TV series The Partridge Family. In addition to being popular on television, the fictional family scored radio hits with songs such as I Think I Love You. After the show's conclusion, Cassidy continued to perform in concerts and with theater productions, and in later years he opened up about his struggles with substance abuse. In the last years of David Cassidy's life, the former teen idol struggled with alcohol abuse, resulting in three DUI arrests in five years. After a 2014 trip to rehab, he told family and friends that he had stopped drinking. As it turned out, Cassidy was still abusing alcohol until the last months of his life, an admission that shocked producers of the docuseries. The bombshell is more devastating to Cassidy's family including his kids Katie, 31, and Beau, 27, who assumed he was living a clean and sober life. 1. Michael Jackson I have a skin disorder. I mean, I'm a black American. I'm proud to be a black American. I am proud of my race. I am But what led to the tragic fate of the King of Pop? Stay tuned as we uncover the heartbreaking truth behind Michael Jackson's untold struggles. He was the extraordinary child star who grew into a global phenomenon, selling hundreds of millions of albums and bridging the cultural divide between black and white. That pop life began when the 11-year-old Michael Jackson moved out of the family fold in Gary, Indiana to live with the soul superstar Diana Ross in her Hollywood mansion. Ross had witnessed the Jackson 5, Marlon, Jackie, Tito, Jermaine, and Michael enthrall an audience at a 1968 benefit for Gary's black mayor, Richard Hatcher, and insisted that the Tom LaMotown boss, Barry Gordy, check them out. Having already paid their dues with relentless touring of what was then called the Chitlin Circuit, small clubs, roadhouses, youth clubs, the Jackson 5 had their rough edges smoothed out by Gordy's hit-making team of stylists and producers. Their first single, I Want You Back, Gate crashed the pop charts in 1969, reaching number one. The following year, they had three more number one singles. By the age of 14, Michael Jackson was already a pop phenomenon. If Jackson's musical upbringing was invaluable, his actual childhood was blighted by a driven father, Joe, who ruled by fear and threat. In the fabled Motown hitmaking factory, too, he existed in a world of adult ambition and venality. Diana Ross, who, after leaving the Supremes, Motown's greatest girl group, had recreated herself as a soul diva, became his first mentor. He later described her creepily as his mother-lover friend, with whom he shared his deepest, darkest secrets. How deep and dark those secrets were would later become disturbingly apparent. The unraveling of Michael Jackson's reputation began in 1993 when he was accused of sexual abuse by the father of Jordan Chandler, a 13-year-old who had spent time at Neverland. The case was eventually settled out of court in 1994, but not before Jackson's sister Latoya had also accused him of being a pedophile. Towards the end of 1993, Jackson admitted being addicted to painkillers and Valium, both of which had been prescribed for stress. The trajectory of his life since that time has, even by the extreme standards of contemporary celebrity, been torturous and controversial. The world's most famous pop star had now metamorphosed into the world's most problematic celebrity, someone whose fame seemed to transcend even the most damning accusations of transgression. Michael Jackson's life, his damaged childhood and reluctant adulthood, his eccentricities and dark secrets, the rumors and accusations that trailed him, and, in the end, must surely have precipitated his premature death, linger too deep in the memory.
If you found this journey through the 1970s as touching as we did, make sure to hit that like button, share your thoughts in the comments, and subscribe for more deep dives into the lives of your favorite stars. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.